Let's open our Bibles. Let's go over to the chapter 6 of the book of Romans. So we're not going to preach the whole book. We're not going to preach the whole chapter. In fact, verse 4 is all we're going to do. So let's talk a little bit about verse 4. Have you ever given thought to all the pieces of this famous verse on baptism? Romans 6, verse 4. We were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, you and I live in a very individualistic society. There are many reasons for this. One reason, and this is no conspiracy theory, it's just, just the fact, one reason is that we are in the end game of a long plan to destroy the main institutions that have held our civilization together. I'm talking about things like church, family, marriage, and we could make a longer list. But these are all being replaced by entertainment, self-indulgence, ideology, and clever marketing. We are degenerating into an individualized consumer culture. But when it comes to baptism, Paul states that of the baptized, he says, we are buried with him. With him, that is, we are buried with Jesus. Well, can't, you can't really be baptized and be individualistic. You're buried with Jesus. Were you baptized with Jesus? Well, when you were baptized, probably the pastor was there with you in the water. But through the act of baptism, the baptized person is buried with him, with Jesus. Maybe you've seen a movie or a television program where two people were buried together in a mine shaft cave-in. Those seem to be rather common on television. And as the hours wore away, they thought that they would die. And they kind of formed one of those kind of a very intense connection with each other because they thought they were going to die together. How much closer is the bond of togetherness when two people actually die together? In baptism, we actually die together with Jesus. We are buried together with him. He died my death on the cross for me in my place, but when I accept him, I die with him at the cross. Now, I do not atone. My death to self does not earn me salvation. But I've joined Jesus in what you might call an extreme partnership. What is more extreme than being buried together? Tell me. There's a lot of trust going on when we voluntarily are buried with someone. But if there is a place where we join together in divine pushback against hyper-individualism, I guess it begins when we join Jesus in being buried with him. Well, how are we buried together with him? Romans 6.4 says, through baptism. Baptism is entry into the grave and entry into a new life through resurrection. You might have noticed that when we baptize, we put the person under the water, completely under the water, and it's not over at that point. That's just the death part. But when we come up out of the water, that's the resurrection part. I'm glad it has both pieces. I don't think we'd have too many candidates for baptism if it was just the death part. Now, this act is symbolic. It's not effective. We don't have any magic dust that we mix into the water. 
The deacons here don't have any, any, any magic chemicals to put in the water. It's just tap water. But here is the different piece. Baptism is an intentional act in which the church affirms Jesus' death and resurrection and in, and in which the church affirms the believer's death and resurrection. Let me say that again. Baptism is an intentional act in which the church affirms Jesus' death and resurrection and in which the church affirms the believer's death and resurrection. See, it's God's commanded act of passage. Or what is the passage? One is dipped completely under the water, which signifies dying. And we don't wrestle the person into the water, do we? We don't force the person under the water. The person comes voluntarily. She is saying yes to Jesus. The command to baptize came from Jesus, and a person who is being baptized is following the command of Jesus. Whenever we follow the command of Jesus, yeah, it's, it's all good. Then what are we baptized into? And again, Romans 6 and the fourth verse of the chapter answers us. What are we baptized into? Into death. Jesus died, the just for the unjust. Let me give you a hint. We for the unjust. The wages of sin is death. Jesus was baptized into death. Not a death he deserved, but that we deserved. He took our place. He the king took the place of his subject. He, the elder brother, took the place of the younger brother and sister. He, the creator, took the place of the created. He, the pure, took the place of the impure. He, the savior, took the place of the lost. The Bible teaches us that Jesus tasted death every person. He experienced the experience you and I set ourselves up for by choosing rebellion. And you and I experienced the experience he set himself up for by living without sinning. He gets all the debits and we get all the assets. That means he tasted the punishment death due to me for sinning while I taste his purity and righteousness and peace of mind and Holy Spirit indwelling. In other words, we get all the good that accrues to us because Jesus is good, while Jesus gets all the bad that accrues to us because we have been bad. And yet, Jesus voluntarily did this for you. He looks at every soul, our soul too, as one he wants to redeem. And he's willing to suffer to the farthest degree of suffering in order to save you. So we are baptized into his death. You know, some people think religion is like really complicated. It's actually kind of on the simple side. We want it to be complicated because then we need to study it a little bit more before we make our decision. Uh, it is deep but I don't think that it's super complicated. We have trouble getting a grip on it because we can't understand why a God of love would do that for, for us. Who, who, who am I? Who are you that, that the infinitely pure God would enter his creation and take our sins and be punished in, in our place? Yeah. 
while the Bible says at Romans 6 verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Just as Christ was raised from the dead. Let's think about that. There's nothing different in the way the believer is raised up and the way Christ was raised up. Nothing different. Nothing at all. Just as or in the same way as Jesus was raised from the dead, how was that? By supernatural power. You and I, who are baptized, are raised up. A converted person is not an improved person. He's a transformed person. He's a person in whom God's supernatural power is working. We can't obey the law. That is, not in our own strength. Our natures are fallen. We have inherited corrupted natures, and on top of that, we've built corrupted habits. We've developed corrupted desires, and it's utterly beyond any self-made, human-powered fix. There's no doctor on the planet that can fix this. But Jesus was raised by divine power, and we are transformed by divine power. Our old habits are not usually whisked away supernaturally, but, but a new power is available to us, a power outside of and beyond ourselves. Now, listen to this. Anyone who claims to be a Christian is claiming that supernatural power is working within. I know that we don't want to think about that sometimes. It's a strong claim. And you know, somebody said, and it's true, strong claims need to be supported by strong evidence. That's right. So God, you know, nobody else thought about this. The angels didn't come to God and say, hey, here's an idea. God thought of this. So God has set himself the task of generating, empowering a group of people who volunteer to be demonstrators of his power. See, he called the press conference, and the whole universe came to watch. You might say, no, you didn't sign up for that. But you did. God, who made the heavens and the earth, the sea, Lake Michigan and all that is in them, gave his son Jesus for you. He's not content to leave you in a wrecked state. And when the prodigal son returned home to his father, the father brought out his best and he clothed his son in it. And when you and I said yes to God, our heavenly father brought out the best and he clothed us in it, the righteousness of Christ. But some of us have memory problems and we've gone back or are putting back on our old feed the pigs clothes. God has something better, way better. He calls us up higher, way higher. How was Christ raised from the dead? Romans 6 verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. How great do you think the glory of the Father is? Well, it must be very great. Have you seen those pictures? Or maybe you've seen it yourself at night. You've seen one of those nights where you're in a very dark place and you, you saw the, the, the stars of the Milky Way spread out across the sky. Was that awesome? One galaxy? God made more than one. Pretty glorious. 
I think the favorite one I ever seen was uh, from one of the dark places in Nevada. We were driving through there, and it's a pretty desolate, pretty, uh, pretty uh, lonely spot, but boy, were those stars shining. And in other places we've seen it, you've seen it, glorious. But paling, paling, has to be paling compared to the glory of God. How great do you think the glory of the Father is? When Moses asked God, show me your glory, God responded by telling him, sorry, you can't see it. Is that what he did? That's not quite it, is it? Exodus 34, God responded by telling him that he, that God, would cause all, not some, all his goodness to pass before Moses. And then, and then he, he kind of tucked Moses into the rocks a little bit. And then he passed by Moses. And what did he do? You know, show me your glory. What does God do? God then proclaims his name. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. And this is the Lord's name. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And it doesn't stop there. By no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. That's God's name. That's the whole, the whole piece. Now, God's glory is expressed in his character. His character is what love is. First John tells us what? God is love. If you had to summarize it even more tightly. Now, if character for humans is made up of the thoughts and feelings combined, then why would not God's character be made up of the same stuff? of God's thoughts and feelings combined. And the statement here from Exodus 34 puts that all together. He is merciful and gracious and, and, and all these things, but he also chooses, but he also is there to choose not to remove all the consequences of sinning. I remember a church member in the uh, state of Utah. We were pastoring down there. She had a secret problem with uh, substance. And she finally got the victory. But do you know, though, that she died of cancer anyway? Not long after that. But she died with the victory. A man may quit smoking and be entirely forgiven for the practice which has taken the health from his body, but God might not, sometimes he does, but he might not eliminate the consequences of those destructive choices. If he's given his heart to Jesus, he will be in the resurrection of the just, but his body may molder in the grave before that glorious day. God is merciful, but he cannot look upon sin so that even Jesus, when he took upon himself our sins, must suffer the wrath of purity against evil. And yet all that glory in his mercy, grace, and patience, and so on, all that glory which we express in those words, God expresses in his creative power also. His word does not return to him empty. The more time you spend in his word, the more time his word spends in you. And his word does not return to him empty. God has thoughts and feelings about you. Say, no, no, God doesn't have thoughts and feelings about me. I'm just a small person. There's 7 billion people on the planet right now, and who knows how much else out there in the universe. God probably doesn't think about me at all. Oh, that's not what the Bible says. God is alert. He's aware. 
And when a bird falls out of its nest, he's aware. When a hair falls off of your head, and some of us look like we've been affected, God is aware. God loves us. He's got thoughts toward us, thoughts and feelings about you. The Bible tells us his desire is to give us a future and a hope. He wants you to succeed. So he gladly forgives you. He gladly gives you his peace. He gladly gives you courage and hope. And he gladly gives you access to his power. So how do you get that? You have to climb a certain number of steps and kiss each one. Do you have to be baptized, you know, 38 times? To do, what do you do? How do you get all this? What, what do we do? And the answer is we don't, we don't. Jesus does it for us. And then we simply cooperate. We submit to him. We go hand in hand. You know, we are not saved by our works, but oh, what a work it is to save us. Paul writes this, Romans 6, verse 4, We were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now this brings us to even so we also. Again and again we see this, this partnership between Jesus and the believer. What applies to Jesus applies to us. Now, I know there's churches that teach, you know, Jesus is so transcendent, he's so far away, we're so awful, and so we have to have intercessors, we have to have saint this and saint that in between, right? You know, there's teachings like that out there. But the Bible doesn't, doesn't really teach it that way. The Bible teaches that Jesus asks us to come to the Father through him, there, we don't need to go through a priest or a pastor. You pray to God directly. You are a priesthood of believers. You're all priests. We're all priests equally. It's a partnership between Jesus and the believer. What applies to Jesus applies to us. He is buried. We are buried. He is baptized. We are baptized. He is raised from the dead. We are raised from the dead. He walks in newness of life. We walk in newness of life. Yeah, pretty complicated. Now, Hebrew thought has some very literal pieces. because It's a very concrete language. Many times the Bible speaks of the believer walking. Walking. Walking is active. It's movement. It is action. It's, it's going from one situation to another situation. The believer walks. Now, he doesn't levitate or slide or glide or float or dematerialize and then rematerialize. He walks. The old word is he ambulates. Yeah, there's a lot of ambulators here, I hope. He actively moves his body from one location to another without an external motor. He has a cooperative part in what's happening. His ability to walk is entirely God-given, but he walks. God doesn't walk. He, Mr. Believer, walks for himself. But somehow we think that we can have spiritual results without spiritual action. We cannot. Our prayer muscles, our faith muscles, they must be used. We must ask so that we can give. Otherwise, our experience shrivels. Friend, in Jesus, activity is the price of living. Locking down in place, hiding in place, waiting for some emergency to pass us by isn't something that's going to grow us. If you're in the hospital too long, what happens? 
that. You have to have physical therapy, right? You need to rehabilitate. Your muscles very quickly begin to atrophy. So we need to continue to be walking and being active. We need, need to understand God's instruction and then execute God's instruction. In a simple term, we, we need to walk the talk. There's an awful lot of talk in our world. It doesn't mean too much when people look at you kind of sideways and say, yeah, those are really big words, but where is the walking? Now then, again looking at verse 4, Paul characterizes what this experience is by calling it a walk in newness of life. The old person has died to self and is living under a different power, an external power. We still have access, by the way, to the old power, our own old self-propelled power. We can still go back to that. But we need the external power, the kingdom power. The Bible speaks of this power in many places and in many ways, but one that I've found most helpful is the promises at 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. All things that pertain to life and godliness, that's a pretty good toolbox to have on hand, wouldn't you say? You know, you can go on the internet and buy kits. Here's a meal kit, here's a kit of this, a kit of that. Here's a set of tools, 28 pieces. All things that pertain to life and godliness, that's the toolbox God gives you. You want to be a Christian? I'll tell you what. I'll just give you everything. How about that? Nothing that we need is missing. It's all there, all things. And we can name several pieces without the slightest difficulty, right? I mean, how many different approaches to prayer? There's many that the Bible helps us with. Engaging in Bible reading, memorizing Bible promises, meeting together with like-minded Jesus seekers, acting on the health message, daily devotional time, singing hymns, listening to preaching, reading a book by, by Ellen White, reading the Bible, all, you know, and there's more. All these may quickly come to mind. God has made it possible for you to know these things, to understand them, and to act on them. It is his divine power that has given you all these things. All these practices help increase our knowledge of our Father who called us by glory and virtue. There is that glory business again. There it is. It's popping up again there. Glory. And virtue, which is kind of a, we don't hear that word anymore. I don't even know if it's allowed on the internet. Okay, it's allowed on the internet, but you don't see it much, right? Virtue is doing good, whether for yourself or for others. Virtue. It's kind of one of those words that they're going to put in the museum pretty quick. But it's still important. It's right there in 2 Peter. It's that reflex fact of the universe that our unselfish acts return to us in blessing without our seeking it. Matthew 25, you remember that? Jesus said, you know, I was so blessed when you came and visited me in prison. I was blessed when you clothed me when I was naked. I was blessed when you fed me when I was hungry. And the believers said, when was that? We, we don't remember that. Jesus, when did we do this for you? And Jesus said, when you've done it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. And that's what I just said. It's that reflex fact of the universe that our unselfish acts 
return to us in blessing without our seeking it. You don't do that to get credit points, but it comes back to you. It comes back to you in good because God is a good God and he runs a good universe. Yes, there's trouble right now. An enemy has done this. Our world is thoroughly uh, spinning down to total disaster. Okay. But you know, God can spin it up and remake this world and make it right. And he's promised by prophecy that's what he's going to do. Then Peter highlights the simplicity. The simplicity of God's promises. Of course, there are conditions all over the place, but, but, but why wouldn't there be? We should look for these promises and pay special attention to the conditions that go with each promise. But everything is provided we need to actively engage in newness of life. And yet, there is no cancellation of all the old temptations. Earth is still an island filled with traps and temptations. Earth is still booby-trapped. There are innumerable places where we should not walk or step, places where some delicious tasting convenience or habit-forming practice awaits us and sirenely calls us to partake just like we used to before we were baptized. The baptized person does not become Superman. He is as needy as before, but he's connected in covenant with the God who wants to transform him. God longs for us to be his partner and friend. He wants us to do everything with Jesus, just as Jesus said that what he saw the Father do was what he did. The Bible reminds you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You've heard a lot of Bible verses here, but I haven't given you too many references. But you know all these, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can make it. You who are living in the most booby-trapped culture there ever was, with temptations almost literally floating in front of you, in front of your face, you who are the most Pavlovianly trained subject of psycho-experimentation and multi-billion dollar marketing onslaught, you, you can do all things, including overcoming all those tricks through Christ who strengthens you. It must be very frustrating to be the devil. Don't you think? I mean, if a person really lays hold on Jesus, the devils can do is gnash their teeth and chatter at each other and, and say, there he goes again. He's, he's tapping the infinite power. We're, we're, we're done for. It must be very frustrating to be a devil. Friend, I want you to know, remember from this verse, Romans 6, 4, but you have to walk. You have to actively engage in Christianity and Jesus will help you. Of course, all the devils are after you to destroy you. Yeah, we know. But all the devils are nothing, nothing, nothing in comparison to one single human person who partners with their friend Jesus. So now read the verse one more time and be encouraged. Friend, God is for you. Romans 6, verse 4, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so, be in partnership and friendship with Jesus. Expect incoming and cooperate with his helps for you. Likely you will make mistakes, but get back up each time and go again. He is making you into more than a conqueror. The best spiritual times of your life are right in front of you, if you'll have them.
God is good. 